imagine there are fools and rascals who say that religious thoughts or scriptures are product of some Bronze Age man's fear and ignorance inspired imagination. Today we'll show you a mind-blowing information about the embryology of the human being from the pages of Srimad Bhagavatam. <laughs> Hare Krishna, my name is Makan Chordas and today we're going to discuss the science of advanced embryology from the pages of 5,000 years old Srimad Bhagavatam. Welcome to our temple in Fuengirola, Spain, where, just give me a sec here, so here we study the Srimad Bhagavatam under the guidance of our spiritual master, His Divine Grace, A.C. Bhaktivedanta Swami Prabhupada, who very nicely teaches us how to kick on the face of all these rascal scientists and Mayavadis and atheists and all these nonsense. Hey, I also want to have my own episode of Kick on the Face. We know that Srimad Bhagavatam was written 5,000 years ago, but guess what these rascals say? They say it's younger, they say it's a compilation of different authors, etc, etc. Simply to diminish the wonderful content it presents to the modern human being. This way or that way, how could anyone in such a remote past have any knowledge about the ovum, the sperm or early phases of development of the human embryo? This question naturally arises when we look at it from a viewpoint of regular education. So, after seeing this video, you can peacefully forget everything that you have learned in school as a complete nonsense. Because there indeed existed a very advanced civilization with a profound knowledge of spiritual realization as well as with a precise insight into the workings of the material world. Here is a little example from the ancient but timeless Vedas. Don't forget that these books were supposed to be written at the time where the Stone Age was just transiting into the Bronze Age, where people were just discovering the secrets of agriculture or metallurgy, or were harnessing skills like pottery and writing. Yeah, right, my foot. The Rig Veda contains a concept of the universe being held together by a force of attraction, aka gravity. The sphericity of earth, the velocity of light, revolution times and distances of other planets. Markandeya Purana speaks about the earth being flattened at the poles or explains why the sky is blue that it is due to sunlight being scattered in the atmosphere. Srimad Bhagavatam, under discussion today, also describes seven continents long before the Vikings or Columbus set their feet on American soil. And what to speak of Australia or Antarctica, which had to wait for the Westerners to discover them until the 17th and 19th century respectively. Briyat Samhita explains, for the pleasure of the hippies, that rainbow is a result of multicolored sun rays splitting in clouds. And even such concepts as relativity of time, proposed centuries later by Albert Einstein, an inspired reader of the Bhagavad Gita, is to be found in the Vedas. So, back to our topic, embryology. In the West, there was no development of this field of knowledge until the invention of microscope in late 17th century. But it really took shape only in the last 120 years. Realization that the human embryo develops in stages was not discussed and illustrated until the 15th century and the first illustration of a fetus in a womb was done by Leonardo da Vinci at that time. After the microscope was discovered in the 17th century by Leeuwenhoek, descriptions were made of the early stages of the chick embryo. The staging of human embryo was not described until the 20th century. The so-called scientists in the West had rather a funny idea 
on how the human being develops in the womb of the mother. As recently as the 18th century, the prevailing notion in Western human embryology was preformation. The idea that semen already contains an embryo, a preformed miniature infant or homunculus, that simply becomes larger during development. In other words, a little midget is injected into the womb and then grows to become a, a, a human being. Anyway, let us now take a dip into the depth of Puranic evidence on embryonic development, which in detail and precision precedes any other such account in the known human history. The following are few verses from the Srimad Bhagavatam, 3rd Canto, 31st chapter, entitled Lord Kapila's Instructions on the Movement of the Living Entities. Translated from Sanskrit language by His Divine Grace, A.C. Bhaktivedanta Swami Prabhupada. Shri Bhagavan Vacha, Karmana Daivanitrena, Jantur Dehopapattaye, Striya Pravishta Udaram, Unsoreta Kanashraya. The Personality of God had said, under the supervision of the Supreme Lord and according to the result of His work, the living entity, the soul, is made to enter into the womb of a woman through the particle of male semen to assume a particular type of body. Three words are specifically important in this verse. Pumsa, of a man, Reta, which means of semen, and Kana, particle. This is a description of a sperm cell. People naturally must have had the notion that male semen and its discharge into woman's womb is the cause of pregnancy. But the idea that semen contains particles couldn't be conceived without an instrument to enhance the power of the scientist's insufficient vision. In the West, such knowledge was not revealed until the 17th century. In 1677, Mr. Leeuwenhoek, the inventor of an early microscope, examined his own semen and found the little fellows wriggling in it. Immediately, cognitive dissonance kicked in, which happens when your beliefs are challenged by non-complying evidence which was never heard or seen before. So when sharing his new discovery with colleagues of the Royal Society of London, he wrote, If your lordship should consider that these observations may disgust or scandalize the learned, I earnestly beg your lordship to regard them as private and to publish or destroy them as your lordship sees fit. Little disturbing, isn't it? His lordship, aka the president of the Royal Society, was at liberty to conceal or even destroy the new startling discovery at his whim if he would find it scandalous or disgusting. Fortunately enough for the Western civilization, he found this discovery to be beneficial and decided to publish it. In the journal Philosophical Transactions in 1678, thus begetting the brand new field of sperm biology. The existence of the sperm, however, was not a new thing for the primitive people of the Vedic age. Facts mentioned here make me wonder though, who is the actual primitive here? Let's have a look at the next verse. Kalalam tvekaratrena, pancharatrena, budbudam, dashahena tu karkanhu, peshyandam batata param. Let's see what each of the word means. Kalalam, mixing of the sperm and ovum. Tu then, ekaratrena, on the first night. Pancharatrena, by the fifth night. Budbudam. A bubble. Translation, on the first night the sperm and ovum mix and on the fifth night the mixture ferments into a bubble. On the tenth night it develops into a form like a plum and after that it gradually turns into a lump of flesh or an egg, as the case may be. So here it gets really interesting. On the fifth night the mixture of sperm and ovum, which by the way was not known in the West until the 19th century, ferments into a bubble. What? A bubble? Sounds funny, a bubble. Well, a bubble indeed forms exactly on the fifth day after conception and in Latin it is called blastula. What does Wikipedia say? The blastula, from Greek blastos, meaning sprout, is a hollow sphere of cells 
referred to as blastomeres, surrounding an inner fluid-filled cavity called the blastocell, formed during an early stage of embryonic development in animals. In humans, blastocyst formation begins about five days after fertilization, when a fluid-filled cavity opens up in the morula, a ball of cells. The blastocyst has a diameter of about 0.1 to 0.2 millimeters and comprises 200 to 300 cells following rapid cleavage, cell division. How on earth could people observe a bubble of 0.1 to 0.2 millimeters of size in the womb of 2B mother without any microscopes, without any advanced technology, without any idea of what to look for? and what to speak of knowing that the object is hollow inside. It would be very interesting to hear the explanations of these descriptions dating thousands of years back from the mainstream scientists. So why these descriptions are there in the Vedas? They are there so precise and so accurate because the Vedas come from Krishna and Krishna created all these processes in the material world. So this is called the descending process of knowledge. We do not have to waste time with research. We simply take from the authoritative scripture and we see that there is no mistake. Hare Krishna, thank you very much for watching. If you like this video, please subscribe <laughs> to the Kick on the Face channel.